Why has the ACCC fined Google 60 million bucks for misleading Australians? And why is the consumer watchdog turning its attention to social media? Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband, changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support. Hi there. Welcome back once again to Vertical Hold Behind the Tech News, the tech podcast where we catch up with Australia's leading tech journalists to dive into the big stories of the week. I'm Alex Kidman, joined as always by Adam Turner. Now, Adam, I'm sorry to say that I've uncovered your dastardly plot to go to the Governor General and get yourself secretly made dual co-hosts of the show so that you could change it to a supply chain podcast. Adam, I'm both disappointed and shocked. What have you got to say for yourself? I would have got away with it if it wasn't for those meddling kids. Well, in this case, that meddling kidman. Yes. So, look, Adam, I'm going to have to send you to the sin bin. But while Adam sits in the sin bin, this week we're joined again by Gizmodo editor Asha Barbershow. Asha, I was delighted to discover that you did exactly the same thing I did when you were sent a dog camera and feed it a review, namely put a cat in front of it. Asha, tell me about your adventures with pet cameras. Yeah, well, I don't. I, I have a Google Nest Hub Max that basically just makes sure that my cat Boston isn't on the kitchen bench looking for scraps. Uh, but this is my first kind of real pet cam with Boston. And uh, as you know, it spits out traits, it's quite interactive. But the little cat, I was about to say Satan. <laughs> Born of Satan, uh, he learned how to break into it to retrieve the bickies within two hours. I've got to admit, my cats did not quite manage to get into it just because I took it away from them. The thing that alarmed me about this particular pet camera was, as you say, it dispenses treats. But when you say dispenses, it sounds kind of friendly. Um, one of my cats basically took a shotgun blast of treats to the face. It's the most spectacular video. And I laugh and feel sorry for it every time I watch it, which is frequently. Yeah, it's it, it, in the app, it's a slingshot motion and it, it looks like a slingshot. So you pull it, the harder you pull it, the more force, I guess, the bickies come out with. And yeah, for the first time I did it, uh, looking, I was looking through the camera and he jumped as high as the ceiling. It was the funniest. I, I felt awful. Uh, I, I didn't. Um, he deserved it for being, you know, such a criminal breaking into his treats. Um, but yeah, it's it's, it's quite insane. You got to look out for the eyes, really. <laughs> Adam, you're a you're a dog owner, of course. Uh, could you be tempted by a remote controlled AI led camera that also fires treats at your hound? I would be tempted by anything that would get my dog to eat his breakfast. He's become such a fussy eater in the last couple of months, and I cannot figure out why. So if flinging it at him trebuchet style is what it takes to get him to eat, I'm all for it. I took it over to my parents' house and uh, tried it on their dog, but he got very disappointed that it was just Bickies and mm. not, you know, barbecue shapes, which are <laughs> his snack of choice. Now you've got me wondering whether you could load like bacon or something else into it, and then I'd just lie in front I'd of it. I'd have one for wait. myself, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, we haven't actually become a pet camera podcast. Asha has instead joined us this week because the consumer watchdog, the ACCC, is on the warpath again. Now, sadly, it's not investigating Adam's many crimes. Well, not <laughs> yet, but it has slapped Google with a $60 million fine for misleading Australians about how it treats our location data. Asha, what's the story here? Yeah, so we've kind of got to rewind back to 2019, actually 2017, 2018 with this one. So um, we first heard about this back in October 2019 with the ACCC at the time detailing its plans to, you know, haul, haul Google, put Google through the ringer, let's just say, for allegedly... Uh, breaching Australian consumer law with these quote unquote misleading claims of of you know location data tracking. Um, yeah, but it, it was during 2017, 2018 um, that Google allegedly, um, even though the federal court has has agreed, we're, we're still covering our backsides here. Uh, that you know they were they were allegedly misleading consumers about this location data. And so, in what way? With I'm, I'm not going to go with the alleged. My backside's feeling quite comfortable here. Let's just say straight out what they've been accused of. Um, <laughs> how were they misleading people? 
Yeah, so uh, Google didn't inform Australians uh, or Australians that are Android users that they needed to have location history setting within Android as well as the web and activity setting disabled. So both of those needed to be disabled. Uh, and uh, according to the ACCC, the language that was used by Google at the time to describe what settings you had to have off to enable, uh, sorry, to, to disable this location tracking, uh, it, it didn't make it, it wasn't very clear that it was actually both of those settings that needed to be disabled to prevent Google from storing your location data. So when I tick the box that says, don't save my location history in my Google account, it didn't do that. No, it wasn't. That's pretty just cut and dry in my setting. book. Right. Yeah. You yeah, then have well, to find I... another secret setting that said, don't save my web and app activity to my Google account hidden in a exactly. different menu. So the language has since been updated um, by Google to make it clear that both settings needed to be off. And if you kind of look at the timeline of this, it was during 2017 and 2018 that these settings uh, or that this language, sorry, wasn't correct. Uh, let's just say it how it is, I guess. But we were told by the ACCC that this this was uh, something they were investigating in October 2019. So it's interesting to know whether or not the ACCC was fully aware of this before they went ahead and changed the language or if they just, I guess, had some uh, scripts running on their on their terms and conditions to see when they update them. It feels to be likely that uh, Google is watching what it is that the ACCC is Googling and keeping an eye on that kind of activity. Because the ACCC forgot well. to tick the box that says don't track what we Google about Google. Don't Google. track. <laughs> <laughs> Although it also feels like an utter minefield because I, I've had to do this, and I'm pretty sure, Adam, and, and actually you've had to do it as well. Anytime you have to describe to a, a consumer, to an everyday phone user, how to do something on Android, iOS is a little better but not a lot, Every time you've got to do it, it's an utter minefield because there's so many Android variants, so many launches, so many different little spaces that a given command might be sitting. So it, I'm with you, Adam. It's cut and dried in the sense of if they've got a checkbox that says it'll do something and it doesn't do it, that's wrong. Mm. At the same time, telling people also you have to find this other setting. Well, depending on the phone, that could be in one of a dozen different menus. It could also be app specific, right? It could also mm. be that you would have to go into uh, uh, let's let's take the heat off of Google for a second. Uh, if you use Meta's apps, you would assume that taking something off uh, Facebook would then take it off Messenger, but p potentially no, you have to you know toggle it off on both of those things for it to do the thing that you're expecting just your overarching account to handle. So when it comes to this data, why does Google want it and why would people perhaps not want Google to have it? Well, I mean, if you're uh, walking uh, along the same path every night or if you're going to a different place, if, with if, you know, then, then what you are telling others that you're doing. or if, if, Adam, why would you want someone to have your, you know, location data with you? I don't even like sharing that with my friends or my family when they're expecting me when I'm, you know, in an Uber on the way to meet them. It's kind of a bit of that creep factor to, to think mm. that someone could know where you are at all times, or even if you have a repetitive uh, routine um, of, of being at the station and walking home, for example, from the same time every night, just it, it lends itself to a whole can of worms of who can then access that data, what in fact Google wants to do with that data. But then again, on the flip side, it could be helpful if I was to go missing, walking, God forbid, walking home from the station. Mm. So, but mostly no. You, you, uh, you, listeners can't see this, but I'm pulling a face that just says, no, I don't, it, no. it just doesn't sit right. Asher looks as awkward as, as it is possible for a human being to <laughs> look right now. It's true. A a and we all do. But <laughs> I think from the Google side of things, the answer is pretty simple. Mm. It wants the location data so it can sell ads because that is Google's end game with anything yeah so that location data could say well asha always walks past a pizza place on her way to wherever she's going let's serve her more pizza place ads or adam you're always going past a bottle oh maybe we'll send you a, a voucher for you know cheaper booze or whatever it might be it, it, the end game with google is knowing more about us so it can sell better ads so it can make more money mm. it's part of sort of what we agree to with these services, not necessarily without thinking about it. But the whole location data tracking thing, I mean, it's been an issue for a while. Asha, do you think individual consumers, leaving the ACCC aside for a minute, do you think individual consumers are still as concerned about this as they used to be? 
I like to think that they are, but then I also know that I kind of do sit somewhat in my own kind of echo chamber um, of people that share my concerns about uploading photos that are uh, geotagged or sharing information such as your first pet, the first street you grew up on, your mum's maiden name, your date of birth. Last four numbers of your credit card. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But then, of course, there are some people that, uh, you know, do sign up for free trials for things, knowing that what, you know, nothing is free. Um, You are, Mm. if something is free, you are giving them your data. Uh, So to a lot of people, they don't mind because they see it as, oh, well, Facebook already has everything on me anyway. What's another company if I'm getting something out of it? So I I do think that the, the average consumer is, I think that there's a 50-50 split on each side that some people accept that companies can know everything about them because they get something in return. Uh, and then there are others that are a bit more locked down with their with their uh, private life on the internet. But they expect vendors to be, on, the tech giants to be at least be honest about what they're collecting. Yeah, and this actually came up recently when Meta announced that it was updating its um, privacy policy. So it wasn't updating it per se. It was just being more transparent about what data it collects. And holy shit, uh, it was it was frightening. Um, but, I mean, they said they are being transparent, and they are. Um, but also, I, you, you kind of knew, but you didn't, you didn't want it thrown Ignorance in your face just how much. Yes. Right, to a certain degree, of course. Um, so yeah, I, I do appreciate from from a obviously a, you know a tech perspective. I do appreciate these, these companies are being more transparent, but it would be much better if they just you know didn't collect this much data. And as you say, it's not just Google here. The ACCC is also going after Facebook because they have their um, Onavo Protect VPN app that they're offering to Australian consumers, which supposedly kept your personal activity and data private except from Facebook. So you really do have to think long and hard about can you trust these people with your data, not just sharing it with other people, but also what they're going to do with themselves. And the box you tick may not mean what you think it means. Well, the simple rule with free VPNs is that they're worth exactly what you pay for them. Oh, yeah. That has long been the case, and especially for Facebook. And actually, Facebook's another good example of what we were talking about a little while ago in terms of it being very difficult to find things Because, again, I feel like I've written about 15 guides over 15 years on how to make your Facebook settings more private, more secure, less shareable, even if you are using Facebook or other meta services. And every time I do, within about three months, they've changed it all. And quite often they've changed it with sweeping changes that meant even if you'd said, yeah, look, I like being in my own small bubble of people that I trust, suddenly you are open to the wide world again. Do you find, Asha, that you tend that you have to go back and regularly check the settings on things like Facebook to make sure that it is actually doing the privacy things you expected it to do and you asked it to do? Well, back when the Cambridge Analytica scandal came out, that is when that is the last time I had a Facebook. So I promptly went and I mean it's deactivated, hmm. um, and I have actually um, now that you say it, I did reactivate it to sell something on Marketplace. Um, about 18 months ago because you can't use Marketplace without Facebook. So I reactivated it. Um, and then I thought that I was, uh, you know, re-deactivating it, re-deactivating it. Yeah, again, uh, turns out I just logged out with like great, you know, anger, uh, like slamming down a phone. So I didn't actually deactivate it properly because there was another step that at the time before that I didn't have to take, as you said, that you know, you have to go down an absolute rabbit warren to get to the to the end, which is just no. I just want to deactivate this. Um, but yeah, that that was that was my most recent experience with Facebook. That it's hidden under settings with tabs with other settings. You then have to, uh, you know, head to something that's got absolutely nothing to do with what you would think being account deletion. Um, and then oh, there it is. It's almost like they don't want you to leave the spider web. <laughs> exactly. But speaking of Facebook, the other thing that the ACCC has said this week that it's doing is looking into uh, social media services, including Facebook. In fact, uh, Facebook parent company Meta has been key to them. What uh, is the ACCC concerned about here, Asha? Yeah, so I like to call the ACCC's digital platforms inquiry Australia versus technology um, because 
we've, we haven't had the best, uh, best history with actually understanding what technology is as a, as a whole. And I'm talking about the regulatory agencies, et cetera, um, even former prime ministers. Uh, anyway, moving on, the next chapter of this digital platforms inquiry is social media. Um, so this has been going on for what, five years now, a bit, bit less maybe. Um, but either way, this is the fifth, uh, the, f- the fifth inquiry, I believe it is. Um, but yeah, so it's basically looking into Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, Pinterest, YouTube, Reddit, and Discord. Um, they'll all be scrutinized as part of this, um, part of this new inquiry. No love for MySpace or Friendster then. <laughs> no, but I can't get the login for my MySpace. I can't <laughs> figure it out and then no one's getting back to me. Uh, but yeah, so for, for the moment, the ACCC doesn't have a whole lot to say on the matter. It's, its announcement this week is basically that it's going to start probing the social media space, um, even though, you know, it, this new thing called social media, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's new. Um, let's start looking into it, truly. Um, but yeah, so it basically wants help from consumers, consumers and businesses in putting together what will be a report for government to then sit there for a little while. What is it that they want to know? What is it that they're concerned about? Yeah, so they're going to be focused on a few things. Um, so competitive constraints, so for both users and advertisers, um, I guess trends in social media mergers. So um, Instagram, for example, was purchased by Facebook, now Meta. Uh, if, if that acquisition was to be, uh, you know, in 2022, it would have been shot down by regulators all around the world. But obviously, they, they can't kind of take backsies on that one. Um, so they're going to be looking at trends in, in social media mergers, acquisitions, and then as well as uh, consumer issues such as scams um, and, I guess, misleading or deceptive content. So that that brings in that whole um, misinformation side to uh, to info that's on Facebook and, and the like, and, and Twitter, of course, as well, would be included in that one. I don't want to come across as defending, well, Meta especially, because they do, as you say, they, they have this habit of buying social media competitors. Um, but then other companies, tech companies, lots of them, in fact, do this all over the place. I don't want to come across as though I'm defending them, but I find this concept of competition in social media really fascinating because the way you grow in social media has to be organic. People have to care about using your products. That's why I brought up MySpace earlier. At one point, mm-hmm. and this was a long time ago, MySpace was huge. It was the dominant social platform. It lost that growth out largely to Facebook at the time organically and it wasn't a question so much of marketplace competition as marketplace appeal i mean we're seeing the same thing with with tiktok and instagram now aren't we yeah i mean uh, that's something that is, that is a bit confusing about what the ACCC has uh, asked in its issues paper and i guess that's why it's asking the questions right because it wants to know the answers to this but it wants to know if there's any barriers to entry um or expansion um, of platforms, so new platforms and hurdles and, and costs faced by consumers and businesses when they try to switch. From a consumer perspective, like if you look at it like porting your banking data from bank one to bank two, that makes kind of that makes sense because you've got your transaction history. If you're going for loans, etc., the consumer data right has that somewhat mm-hmm. sorted. Um, but you know, I'm not sure the idea of porting your Facebook photo albums from 2012 to another platform is worth anyone's time in looking into. Yeah, it's a weird kind of data set and it's even a weird kind of approach because what we've seen from social media as well is this kind of split of different media as well. I mean, yes, you can do video direct to Facebook, but very few people do because they're doing that on TikTok. They're doing that to a lesser degree on Instagram. You can do short messages, for example, on Facebook, but that's what Twitter is for. So I don't know, you know, if we if we were to be able to wind the clock back, I don't know that I would have wanted to shunt all of my Twitter messages directly over to Facebook as a thing because an awful lot of them, even more than usual, would have seemed like incoherent nonsense. Absolutely. And, I mean, from the messaging perspective, it kind of, and I feel it myself daily when I message someone on Twitter, I message someone on Instagram, on Slack for work, and then you've also got Messenger, and then I message. It would be great sometimes, I think, if all of that was in the one place. But then I have Instagram for my personal life. Twitter is mostly work people. You kind of don't want that blending. So, but then when it comes, so that, that point aside, another point that you, that you brought up, each platform has its own individual thing that it offers you. So, 
uh, a new competitor in the market, I guess, be real. It's this, if, if you've heard of it, it's just basically a, a photo sharing platform. You share a photo in the moment because you're being real, wild. But that doesn't actually compete with another platform directly because each platform sort of offers you something different, as you said. And so I'm not sure that this idea of competition is overly relevant. I don't know. At the same time, I guess mm. the argument could be made that, you know, well, Meta especially, because they're so big in social media, they own so many other services, that if I was trying to start a social media platform, that it would be, well, not only obviously expensive to do the actual development and work out where the servers were going to live and all the data protection issues around that, it might just be a non-starter. A lot of people might be looking at it going, well, I won't do that because it's impossible to compete with Meta. And I guess it's reasonable for the ACCC to step in and say, well, consumers probably deserve a bit better than that. Absolutely. And that's, I think, a big part of their barriers to entry piece um, Mm. regarding that. So, uh, and I I just did say it myself, you Mm. know, that everything offers something different. I'm I'm sure that that's because competing platforms had to go, well, we can't do what Meta does. Uh, Sorry, we can't do what Facebook does. We can't do what Instagram does. We have to do something different. Um, so, uh, you know, I answered my own reasoning for doing that in, in justifying another, uh, another point, which is, you know, absolutely shouldn't be slept on. How is that different to, we'll say, looking at banking or telcos, the, there are very high barriers to entry as well. It's called a shed load of cash if you want to compete with your Telstra and your Optuses of the world or if you want to compete with your Commonwealth banks of the world. So it's not like it's easy to waltz in and say, I'm going to come up with a competitor one of these. Like, what's the difference here? Because if you've got the kind of money behind you that you could start a telco or start a bank, then you could certainly waltz into this space and start something vaguely competitive. I guess getting people to, to I suppose, because you could probably walk in. I just have to look at Aussie Broadband, for example. A lot of people jumped ship to them because they were this new entrant that offered something different to the ones that, people were used to, I guess, the major players that people were used to. Um, and then you've also got to look at, uh, you know, newer banks. The, ne- the neo banks. You're, yeah, they were, up. exactly. Yeah. So they, they, they started getting, you know, provisional licenses, et cetera. But then that also brings in the regulatory and mm. kind of super heavy regulatory environment we have for things like telecommunications and finance. Just there's stuff all when it comes to your data on an online website. I guess the problem for a new entrant, though, is exactly the same way actually identified with Google. It's the ads. Mm. That's how they're making their money. And we know that the vast majority of that money is going to Google, is going to Facebook. I mean, we went through this whole drama a few years ago where Facebook said, well, we don't want to play with the news bargaining code. Therefore, we're ganking anything that vaguely looks like news off of Facebook in Australia. Uh, if you were a new competitor, it would be you might have the you know some kind of USP that that people went oh yes I want to be on that service which is great maybe for getting numbers of people on the service but you've then got to actually get the advertisers on board to help pay for all of this and Facebook et al seem to have that sewn up. Yeah, and I mean, it comes back to your point that you said a little while ago as well, that a lot of these companies started more than 10 years ago, the the ones that are the dominant players in this space, when they were growing along with the industry, growing along with advancements. Facebook didn't start on a cloud. Uh, You know, they had in a college dorm room, if if that's the, you know, the tale to be believed. Um, They were growing with, with, with the environment and now you've got new players that come in that, you know, hope to, and how would they spread the word necessarily about their new platform on Facebook? Well, you could probably so buy some might... ads from Facebook. Mm. They'd take you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, well, once they worked out what you were trying to do, they'd probably shut you down, right? Uh, mm. Maybe, allegedly, perhaps. Now, you mentioned that the ACCC is asking questions, and it's asking questions of consumers. I don't think we should downplay the fact that people can actually have their say on this. But how? How do they actually do that? Yeah, so it's a little bit tricky. Um, instead of uh, sometimes the ACCC hosts surveys that you can fill out as a consumer, this isn't like that, unfortunately. This is uh, what's called a response to an issues paper. So the the issues paper, uh, which you can search by either going to Gizmodo Australia 
and searching for ACCC social media. Or you can go to the ACCC's website, shameless plug, uh, and, and, you know, following the links to the issues paper, you have a look at the issues paper and then you, I think on one of the first pages, it tells you an email address where you can send through your thoughts. So it's probably best to, you know, actually read the paper before you answer some questions that you don't know what you're actually answering. But there's a section for consumers, a section that's more appropriate for advertisers and other businesses, et cetera. But basically, it's they just want to know how you actually use social media, what you consider to be the barriers, what you consider to be good, bad, ugly about the platform. Um, and a, a lot of the times, people don't understand that, well, not don't understand, sorry, don't realize that they can actually have their say. And, you know, truly, it, they're going to get it wrong if if consumers don't tell the ACCC this stuff. And then you can't exactly then at the end turn around and go, well, they got it wrong if you didn't bother making your submission or making your voice heard. Well, that just about wraps up another episode of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Asha for joining us. Thanks for having me. And Asha, it's time once again for you to face up to the patented, low-carb, Vertical Hold three questions of doom. I will ask all three. You can answer them in any order you like. Where okay. can people find your work online? Where can they find you on social media? And our current big contentious question for the week, What's the worst thing you've ever spent your own money on? Yeah, well, you can find me on Gizmodo Australia, so gizmodo.com.au. Uh, then on Twitter, it is Asha B with five E's because four E's and three E's were taken. Um, and the answer to the last question, so I actually have one. It is a 2000 model Holden Astra. I bought it in 2007 to 2007 and it was an absolute lemon and I saved 10 grand of my first year working. Um, it was a bar job while I was at uni, saved 10 grand of my own cash and I purchased a lemon that would stall in neutral and redline, no, sorry, redline in, in neutral and stall in fifth gear. Nice. With the beauty. <laughs> this is scary because... The first car I ever bought was a Holden Astra, a little bit before yours, and it was a lemon too. It's, it's this entire electrical panel would just give up the ghost. So you'd be cruising along at 110 and suddenly the speedo would just go whoop and drop to nothing. <laughs> You're still doing 110, but it will not tell you how fast you're going. None of the brake lights would work. It was a fun time. But not wasn't fun it at just? All. <laughs> I remember being at the lights and I was uh, I wasn't revving, the car was, and I was next to a nana. I'm like, it's not me trying to race you, I promise. It was a very bad time. Got rid of it. Still got my Mazda 3 I purchased the year after, though. Well, the nice thing about Holden, of course, is we can say nasty things about them because they're not a brand in Australia anymore. They're not likely to come after us. But if you <laughs> did want to come after myself or Adam, you can catch us online at Vertical Hold AU on Twitter, at the Vertical Hold Facebook page, or at verticalhold.com.au. And as always, thanks, everyone, for listening, and thanks for your great reviews. Don't forget to tell your friends about us and help us spread the good word in 2022. Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband, changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support.